Colonialism is a now mostly defunct approach to dealing with foreign groups of people and the land and other resources they control. Under the logic of colonialism, that you are able to militarily dominate those other people means you are more capable of also managing their lives and whatever wealth they might control. A militarily powerful nation, then, might roll into a new continent, defeat the locals in battle, and then set up any existing cities and towns and villages and tribes as a sort of economic offshoot of that victorious, dominating country. This is a practice that has been seen throughout history on various scales, but it really heated up on a global level in the 15th century, when mostly European nations began to explore the world beyond their traditional stomping grounds and realized that, first, there's a lot of world out there, and second, the people living in these places they were beginning to discover and explore were not as good at war as them. The reasons behind these imbalances are many, and most trace back to geographic differences and the raw randomness of history. If the Europeans had encountered some of the cultures they conquered during this period, during an earlier period, they would almost certainly have been handedly defeated instead. But because these encounters took place at a time of relative wealth, population abundance, and technological sophistication for the Europeans, and because that upsurge in these traits generally correlated with the opposite elsewhere, the world looked like a big candy jar to many of these nations, and proponents of the ideologies to which they subscribed, from mercantilism, which allowed them to justify the taking of resources and labor in the form of people elsewhere to strengthen their homeland, to Christianity, which, being a proselytizing faith, encouraged them to convert the non-believers they encountered around the world. These incentives added up to a pretty compelling rationale for exploring the world, conquering anyone they could find, and leveraging that abundance to reinforce their hold in the highly contentious playing field of European politics and continental warfare. The relationships between colonist and colony changed over the years, eventually culminating in the majority of these captured groups of people being granted freedom from their conquerors in the decades following World War II, resulting in the situation we find ourselves in now, where post-colonial legacies remain, including a huge swath of negative incentives and disadvantages for those who were yoked by outside entities for long periods in recent history alongside new, so-called neo-colonialist relationship models, which create something similar to the colony model, but using the mechanisms of modern warfare, diplomacy, capitalism, and trade networks to weave that larger structure into place bit by bit, rather than implementing it as a single, forceful whole. Neo-colonialism is very different from colonialism, in other words, but it results in many of the same positives for one side and negatives for the other. Among those upsides for the dominant player in this sort of game is the ability to outsource, for lack of a better term, many of the negative aspects of the modern economic system. It's cheap and easy to buy things online, for instance, and the quantity and selection of things along with the ease of purchasing, the lower and lower prices, and the often quite generous return policies has arguably been one of the more widely experienced benefits of globalization. Pretty much everyone in the wealthy world, whatever their position in that structure, now have more easy access to more things that are cheap or free than ever before in history. The costs of that cheapness and freeness, though, are felt elsewhere. The waste created by this system piles up in poorer regions around the world. And that includes waste from the production of cheap products, but also the waste from returned products that cannot be resold for whatever reason. The waste from spent batteries and outdated hardware, the waste from manufacturers creating the plastics and silicon and other materials needed to build these products. And that's alongside the reinforcement of a model that locks in a regional system that ensures the only viable career in some regions is to sit on a production line, performing the same task over and over. To put all these things together, all the while wondering if you'll be replaced by automation in the near future. And then there are the regions where the pre-manufactured raw materials are harvested, the forests cut down, the soil poisoned, the bedrock strip-mined, 
the air filled with dangerous particulates. What I'd like to talk about today is another segment of the modern economy that is suffering from what we might call post-colonialism syndrome, and the reason why this collection of technologies and businesses may need to change in fundamental ways to help fix the problems to which they contribute sometime in the near future. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you hear, consider contributing to its production at letsknowthings.com slash support. There you will find links to recurring options, to one-off donation options, and to ways that you can help support the show non-monetarily. A huge thanks to everybody who is already helping or who has helped support the show in some way, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. And one more quick note, if you're enjoying what I'm doing here on this podcast, you might also enjoy another one of my projects, Brain Lenses. You can check that out at brainlenses.com. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from Rolling Stone, and it's entitled, Is Streaming Music Dangerous to the Environment? One Researcher is Sounding the Alarm. This was one of the better written and more nuanced takes on a study that was published in mid-2019, which indicated that streaming things like music and videos is not only not carbon neutral, it may even, in some cases, be worse for the environment than tangible delivery vehicles for these media, DVDs, CDs, vinyl, things like that. The study itself was pretty clever in how it was set up, though it relied on a lot of best guesses and estimations as the type of data required to get a true sense of ecological cost for these storage and delivery mediums isn't available in comparable formats, and what data is available is incomplete. The University of Oslo professor behind the study was able to combine some existing, fairly well-established data into something that gestures at the truth, the truth as it exists in some averaged specific cases at least, A quote from that piece, explaining his method. This professor, whose name is Kyle Devine, quote, conducted his research on streaming using data from the Recording Industry Association of America for 2015 and 2016. He averaged the number of songs streamed and downloaded in those years and factored it with the amount of electricity it takes to download one gigabyte of data, which at the time was roughly equivalent to the amount of electricity it takes a standard light bulb to shine for an hour. Divine then used Greenpeace's Click Clean scorecard to find what kinds of energy were being used to power streaming sites, coal, nuclear, gas, or renewable, and used the average amount of carbon dioxide equivalents created by each to create an approximate picture of greenhouse gas emissions in the streaming era, end quote. This study was accompanied by an appreciated sense of self-awareness by the professor. A quote from him, from that Rolling Stone piece, goes on to say, Quote, that electricity figure does not include storage and processing in the data center, and it doesn't include user devices and the electricity to charge your phone or anything like that. There's additional complexity. File resolution matters. It's more data if you're watching a video on YouTube versus streaming a high-definition album on Spotify. The variables are almost endless. End quote. Notable here is that many of the largest entities in the streaming space are already, or intending to become, carbon neutral. Spotify, for instance, already claims to be 100% carbon neutral, an accomplishment made possible through the use of carbon offsets and the decommissioning of six of seven of their previously operational data centers. What's interesting about that claim is not that it's wrong. It's not, at least if you consider carbon offsets to be valid, which many people do not, seeing as how they're not always certified to a reliable standard, and they often involve making investments in carbon-soaking-up technologies, or the planting of trees, that won't necessarily help with the CO2 situation in the near future, and which won't necessarily last as long as they would need to, to serve as true counterbalances to what they're meant to offset. Anyone can plant a tree and say, I've just offset the amount of carbon that tree will soak up over the course of its life, so I can now release that much CO2 into the atmosphere without worrying about it. 
But that doesn't mean that tree will grow as big as it could. It doesn't mean that it won't be killed or cut down before it reaches its full potential. There are a lot of understandable problems with this approach. In other words, it's absolutely better than nothing. But carbon offsets, as they currently exist at least, are also probably not a solution unto themselves. Instead, they serve as a bridge concept between where we are now and better, true, hopefully near-future solutions that will allow these businesses to continue to do what they do, but with fewer negative consequences. All that said, part of what's notable about this situation is that alongside those offsets, Spotify saved themselves tons of money and energy usage by switching over to the Google Cloud platform, instead of continuing to run all their own servers. Those six data centers they were able to get rid of did not disappear. They were just replaced with other servers that Google already operates around the world. This almost certainly wasn't just a PR move, though, to make their own energy bill look cleaner. The benefits of switching to cloud services, like those Google operates, are often quite substantial. And though there are also downsides, it's understandable why even massive companies like Spotify would want to hand over the majority of their efforts in this portion of their industry to another company that can do them more capably. Before we move on, let's talk a bit about data centers, what that even means and why they are such a big deal, even if most of us will never see one in real life or maybe even have reason to think about them in our day-to-day -day lives. A data center, at its most fundamental, is a building full of computers and computer accoutrement. So racks and racks of computer hardware stacked and in rows with little access points scattered throughout, mostly so the IT folk can fix things if anything goes sideways. But there are also inputs and intermediary systems that connect the internet to this stockpile. The idea is to create vast quantities of storage, processing power, and other such resources so that you can benefit from economies of scale, putting them all in one place and then tweaking things so that you have lower electricity costs or lower cooling costs, which is why these centers are sometimes built underground or in very cold climates, because then the natural ambient temperatures help keep the otherwise hot machines cooler without additional cost. But that setup also allows folks who tap into these resources to more easily scale their users up and down as necessary. A practical example of what that means can be seen in many tech startups. In their early days, when they only have a few dozen or a few thousand users, many tech companies don't require too much storage space or the ability to deliver too much data to their users. All that streamed media, for instance, won't add up to much if you're only delivering songs to 100 people. As the company gets larger, though, those requirements increase, and at times very quickly, often by an order of magnitude or more. What these setups allow a company to do is pay for storage, processing, etc. as they need it. So if you're serving 100 users, you will pay for sufficient resources to serve those 100 users. If you scale up to a million users, you can simply increase what you pay the owners of the data center, and you'll have the resources you need often without any noticeable lag on the user end, and definitely without having to build more data centers of your own, which was kind of how things worked before this dynamic and business model emerged. Early data centers were buildings that mostly just held one or two massive computers, because that much space was required to house computers at that point in time. But as computers have gotten smaller, these centers evolved to instead hold a great many computing components, most or all of which work together to become a Voltron-like singular entity made up of many parts. And part of why they're held on racks instead of standard computer cabinets or boxes is so that those individual components can be swapped out periodically for better hardware. In this way, we have a sort of ship of Theseus situation where the data center remains the same while its pieces over time are entirely replaced. The whole never ceases to be, but the individual components are upgraded, which keeps that larger whole useful, even as the needs of their clients change. A big shift in this space took place in the years leading up to, during, and just after the dot-com bubble of the late 1990s and into the early 2000s. During this time, the internet was abuzz, and new companies were popping up everywhere, bloated with cash and looking to build up their infrastructure fast. 
Many of these companies built their own smaller data centers to handle their online presence. But even those companies that didn't hire out anything for their main setup often used online services that would launch a backup of their presence from elsewhere, from a data center somewhere around the world, in case their own servers went down for some reason. Despite the aforementioned ability to swap out racks of hardware with new, updated hardware, the technology used in these data centers evolves so quickly that most centers are considered to be obsolete after a mere seven years in operation and are either completely refurbished or decommissioned by their nine-year anniversary. Despite the speed of asset degradation, though, and the cost to build and operate them, they remain solid investments for the companies that specialize in building them because of the array of services they offer to numerous industries that seem to be endlessly hungry for them. Cloud computing services, for instance, is the bundling up and then portioning out of the computer resources that I mentioned earlier, processing power, storage space, that kind of thing. This term is a broad one and includes subservices like serverless computing, which involves using some of those cloud-based resources to essentially build a virtual computer of whatever power you need externally that you can access and operate from your personal computer. Utility computing, which is a business model within this model that involves paying for what you use rather than a flat fee for general usage, a model that is particularly useful for startups because, again, it allows them to pay low fees they can afford early on, having those fees increased as their customer base increases. There are code-on-demand services, which involve running code located on a data center computer and outputting the results to devices at your home or office. So if you visit a website that loads a video in a little video player, or play any kind of video game online, or use an app of any kind, chances are you are summoning a little or a lot of code from a distant computer, the output of which loads on your device. And then there are software-as-a-service options that allow users to buy software and pay a subscription fee rather than a single upfront sticker price. The validity and value of that latter model is debatable as it has many pros and cons, including the inability to actually buy and own software in some cases, instead being forced to pay the company that made the software forever if you want to keep using it. That said, it also allows for more frequent iteration of that software, sturdier revenue models for the companies making it, and it allows the software to be deployed from these distant computers, in some cases accessing software running on those computers, code-on-demand style, anytime you use the program but more commonly in these cases, downloading the software from that distant computer onto your own computer, and then having that software check in with its original distant home from time to time to make sure that you're paid up. What these data centers allow, then, is a sort of front-of-house, back-of-house model where they can do a lot of complex, expensive, resource-intensive stuff in the background, and we, on our computers and phones, at work and at home, are able to enjoy the outputs the benefits of all that work, without having to get our hands dirty, without needing to know how to operate a server, and without needing to worry about how all the pieces fit together. That stuff is done in sprawling buildings filled with hot, powerful machines in far-off places scattered around the world, not something we have to worry about in order to benefit from their output. It's similar, in some ways, to the restaurant model, where much of the hard work is done behind the scenes so that we don't need to know how the sausage is made, allowing us to enjoy the front-end, customer-optimized version of things without worrying about whatever it is happening back in the kitchen. It also conceals the reality that from some perspectives, the work and innovation being done in this space is really just a repeated reimagining of how we manage the same finite resources. Recombining bits of information into different shapes using different business models delivered in somewhat different ways and allowing that repackaging to stand in as a type of innovation. Which it is, really, but the way that we are sold these products on the outside, you could be forgiven for thinking that the underpinnings of the games you play on your smartphone are fundamentally different from the music you stream or the software you use at work. When in reality, they're essentially the same thing, coming from the same ultimate source, just combined, portioned out, and optimized in different ways. And that's wonderful because it allows entities like Google, which runs its cloud services using this model, to help companies like Spotify to scale up and down by connecting their many data centers located around the world into clusters of distributed mega data centers. And when Google generates its electricity from renewable sources, which is increasingly the case, 
and benefits from better and better economies of scale, which it does. The prices go down for everyone, the energy used becomes less polluting, and the quality of these services tends to improve over time for everyone. Because anyone who does not keep getting better and cheaper in this space is run out of business. It's also cool, in a more general person-to-person -person sense, that we can have smaller and smaller devices that can do more every year, because a huge portion of the computing they need to do is done off-site at one of these data centers with the output of that computation sent back to our devices in less time than it takes us to notice it happening. That effort, though, still takes place. And just like not having to see firsthand in Europe, the reality of colonialism didn't mean that it wasn't taking place, so too does it not mean that there's not a complex and energy-intensive root system underpinning the multitude of technological conveniences we enjoy today. The crux of that Rolling Stone article, again, is that, in some cases, it may be more ecologically sustainable to buy a CD than to stream music. And that would seem to be the case, especially in circumstances where you plan to listen to the same album over and over again. From a piece published in The Conversation, entitled The Environment Impact of Music, Digital, Records, CDs, Analyzed, quote, Even though new formats are material-free, that doesn't mean they don't have an environmental impact. The electronic files we download are stored on active, cooled servers. The information is then retrieved and transmitted across a network to a router, which is transferred by Wi-Fi to our electronic devices. This happens every time we stream a track, which costs energy. Once vinyl is purchased, it can be played over and over again, the only carbon cost coming from running the record player. However, if we listen to our streamed music using a hi-fi sound system, it's estimated to use 107 kilowatt hours of electricity a year, costing about 15 pounds to run. A CD player uses 34.7 kilowatt hours a year and costs 5 pounds to run. So which is the greener option? It depends on many things, including how many times you listen to your music. If you only listen to a track a couple of times, then streaming is the best option. If you listen repeatedly, a physical copy is best. Streaming an album over the internet more than 27 times will likely use more energy than it takes to produce and manufacture the same CD, end quote. The takeaway, then, is that in some rare cases, non-digital formats could make more sense, in terms of energy used and pollution created at least, because of the cost in terms of energy of transmitting information from these data centers to the end user. They go on to note that this could mean that downloading the music that you listen to over and over might be beneficial, because that stores the music on your device, which means you download it maybe once, maybe once a month or so, as is the case with Spotify playlists and albums that you download, which is far less than the every single time you hit play streaming that takes place otherwise by default. The ease of use of these systems that's evolved over the years, especially since the turn of the century, as the app economy post-smartphone era took off, has also led to a situation in which redundancy is increasingly incentivized. In hardware, redundancy is often limited by space and materials, but in the world of software and data and cloud storage, those limitations are less pressing, and at times nearly non-existent for all intents and purposes. It's estimated that as of 2018, there were 33 zettabytes, which is 33 trillion gigabytes of data, in the world. And that's predicted to increase five times by 2025, to around 175 zettabytes. That requires a lot of storage, and thankfully we have the storage to keep all that data. A lot of those racks of hardware at data centers are reserved for high-density hard drives to keep these things saved and safe. Unfortunately, it's also estimated that only about 6% of the data that we've ever created as a species is still in active use today, and the rest of it just languishes, mostly in these data centers, stockpiled, hoarded, and guarded, but never touched, and likely never again touched. That means around 94% of all the stuff that we've got stored, which uses energy and hard drive space, is just a data landfill, using up energy but serving no purpose. There was a piece about this figure in the Japan Times recently called The Environmental Cost of Keeping Mail and Files Online Keeps Rising, in which they say data centers use 2% of the world's electricity, with that figure expected to increase to 8% by 2030. That means that as of now, about 1.88% of the world's energy output is potentially being used to sustain a data landfill full of things like a copy of a copy of an email that you sent two decades ago and then deleted from your account, 
old garbage files full of random characters, and cached redundancies of things, held on to, maybe contractually, but completely worthless, for anything beyond taking up space and adhering to an antiquated user agreement or ancient filing system. Now that's not ideal, but it does mean there's a chance that by improving our data centers, we could go a long way toward improving a lot of other things, including dramatically reducing our overall energy usage and thereby, maybe, our overall CO2 output. Some entities are already acting upon this, building or hiring clean energy for these purposes, and it's possible that if we can come up with more efficient systems for distributing data, potentially involving some new data transfer standard or hardware that allows us to use less energy for these purposes, that would have an outsized impact because of how many industries it would positively influence. We may also see changes as a consequence of impending data regulation laws, which often truncate the amount of time large tech companies in particular can hold on to data, which could perhaps incentivize them to empty out these landfills on a regular basis, reducing the number of data centers that would need to be built, and the amount of energy used to keep all of this useless data stored and safe. These companies could implement more efficient systems themselves, of course, but outside regulations often cause such entities to make changes faster. There's a chance that the perception of eco-friendliness becomes a competitive advantage in the data center marketplace, at which point the forces that be may implement more and more impactful solutions themselves sooner. In a lot of cases, though, new regulations, or even the threat of new regulations, can goose these companies into acting sooner and more completely than they might otherwise. It may be, too, that we'll begin to store more of our data locally, as tiny computers on a chip get more powerful and more efficient, and as local private networks between our phones, watches, and smart speaker voice assistants begin to share some of these processing responsibilities in situ, rather than having to send everything to a data center every time it wants to process something. That data center, often located across the country or the world, this is similar to it being more efficient to download music once and then to listen to it over and over on your smartphone, rather than re-downloading it every time, which is what streaming is. If we can keep more of the transmission local, that could reduce the footprint of our tech-enabled activities and put less strain on energy-gobbling data centers, a little bit at least. It's anyone's guess if any of these more human-scale approaches will become common, or if they'll even prove to be effective over time. But it does seem like economic forces are already beginning to force big tech's hand when it comes to making their data centers more efficient. One can only hope that such movement will continue in an overall positive direction, and that practical means of speeding up that transition will emerge along the way. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter of the show. You can find different options as to how you might do that at letsknowthings.com slash support. There you'll find links to the show's Patreon page, to other methods of making recurring donations, to a variety of different ways of making one-off donations, and various means of supporting the show non-monetarily. The show is a one-person setup, and I am only able to commit the time that I do to it each week because of supporters like you. So if you're finding any value in this show, consider becoming a supporter at letsknowthings.com support. A huge thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show in some way, shape, or form. That means a lot. Thank you. The book that I'd like to recommend today is entitled Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed by author Jason Satterfield. The core of this book, to me, is really about legibility, a term that I'd never heard applied in this way before, the way that it is in this book, but it makes a whole lot of sense after you hear about it and start to read examples of this happening around the world across time. In essence, the argument that he's making is that states will go out of their way to try to make things that they can measure, and to try to make individuals and ideas and everything else as measurable and thus understandable and controllable, perhaps even optimizable, as possible. But in many, many, many cases, this enforced legibility actually hinders or even harms the very things that the state is trying to understand and optimize. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Seeing Like a State by Jason Satterfield. 
You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at xllifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the show at letsknowthings.com. You can find a couple of my other projects at brainlenses.com and askcolin.com, and you can reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook, and at Colin is my name on pretty much all of the other ones. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.